this uh, Linux Day Spotlight course. Um, I'm sure you all heard about um, NSA and CIA and all those uh, very nice people are spying on us. And um, today we have Jan here and he's going to tell you uh, what you can do about that. And um, he's a long time Linux user and a uh, GPG enthusiast. I think he would call himself maybe. And uh, yeah, please um, fill out one of these feedback sheets and tell us what you like about this course and what you don't like, especially that. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming and uh, please Jan. Welcome everybody, also from my side, um, to this talk about reconquering <laughs> about reconquering private mail with GPT. The plan for today is very easy. We start with the theory part in the first half of the course and then we move on to some practice where I can show you how to hack the commands into the command line to make GPT do what you want. So first of all, a uh, small question, who of you has ever had experience with some encryption, be it read some paper or even had some experience with practical tools? Just raise your hands. Okay, that's roughly half of you. Good, so you will learn a lot today. So first of all, the motivation, why are we all here? Um, currently, if you send an email to one of your friends, this is like a postcard. What does that mean? It means that anybody who transmits the email can read the message. Anybody between you and the recipient can impersonate the sender, so it can't, you can't be sure whether the email is really from the person who claims to be. And you can also not be sure whether the content, ha content hasn't been modified in the meantime, so anybody is able to change it. <coughs> this is not desirable in total, so what we want instead is something like a sealed envelope around our mail. Um, which means that we want three things. The first one being secret content, which we call secrecy. Then we want to be sure about the sender, which we call authenticity. And then is, there is the third thing, which, um, where we want that nobody tampered with the mail in between, which we call integrity. So these are the three things we want to attain today. <coughs> But how do we achieve this? Well, there are many building blocks that have to be used in order to achieve it. Um, first of all, mathematics. This is a very strong component in encryption in general, but we will not look at mathematics today. Of, um, lucky you. So <coughs> on top of mathematics, you will have some kind of cryptography. This is some um, um, bit twisting around, but also number theory. And then we, of course, will use the internet to um, send the emails on the one hand, but also to transmit key material between the users. And the, uh, the fourth and most important one is sensible users. So all the cryptography is useless if you as the user do not know what you're doing and you don't know the concepts behind all the cryptography. <coughs> so let's start with a small warm up. Um, what you see here is a schema which we call symmetric encryption. In symmetric encryption, we will read the image from left to right. We will start with Alice. Alice wants to send a letter to Bob on the right-hand side. So Alice first sets up the message, which we can see here, and she also thinks of something which we call um, a secret key. The secret key, you can think of it just as zeros and ones, a lot of them, um, most of the time 20, uh, 200 or even more. And what she does is she takes both her message and the secret key she um, has and puts it into something which we call the encryption algorithm. So you can just think of it as the box which you see here. You put the message and the key just inside the box and then the box starts computing on both of the inputs and eventually it will end up with an output which you can send over the email transfer program. So what you see in the middle is the sealed envelope we want to achieve. And the sealed envelope can be copy-pasted into your email editor and can be sent via normal mail. And <coughs> on the recipient side, you just take the sealed envelope and you have to have the very same key that has been used during encryption. This is why the key is actually the same here. And you take both the key and the envelope and put it into the decryption algorithm. And then the decryption algorithm knows how to obtain the message from the encrypted envelope and Bob is able to read the message. <clears throat> this is quite simple so far. Did everybody understand it here? 
You do not just ask questions at any time, please. So what does symmetric encryption give to us? Um, of course, we attain secrecy by the principle in the encryption and decryption machine, but we do not gain any authenticity and um, integrity. So why not? Um, you can think of Alice and Bob being two partners. And of course, if Alice sends the message to Bob, it is clear to Bob that he did not write the message himself. But you could also think of Bob being some kind of an evil person who wants to claim that Alice sent a letter to him. So he can just make up any message he wants to and sign it uh, and encrypt it with the key. There is nothing that prevents Bob from faking a message coming from Alice. So a third party who might look at the decrypted letter cannot be sure whether Bob or Alice sent the letter, which means we do not have any authenticity. Um, we also do not have any integrity because um, from the sender to the recipient, anybody in, the, in between can modify the email and if it's not a plain English text, um, you're not able to see whether the content has been modified once you decrypt it. So it's easy if there's some text involved and the human looks at the message and he sees, oh, this is just garbage and not an English text anymore. But there are situations where it's more difficult to determine whether the message has been modified. So plain symmetric encryption doesn't give us any integrity. But what can we do about it? We can come up with something which we call asymmetric encryption. Um, it is the very same picture as before with only one difference. We have two different keys here the red one and the blue one. So <coughs> the, these keys are no longer any random bit strings you can make up, but you can think of them as very big numbers. And these numbers have some mathematical properties and they are connected to each other, which means that if Alice uses the red key on the sender side to encrypt the message, only the owner of the blue key will be able to decrypt the message again. So once again, you use the red key to encrypt the message and you can only use the blue key to decrypt the message again. This is very important. It is not possible to use the red key to decrypt the message again by the mathematical properties we use. So <coughs> how do we use it for encryption? What we do is we think of both the red and the blue key belonging to Bob and one of the keys, the red one, will be published among all the other people who want to send a message to Bob, which we call the public key. This key is the public key because he can give it to any person he wants to and they will be able to encrypt messages for Bob. The blue key, in turn, is a different one, which we call the private key. And the private key will stay at Bob and only at Bob. She, he should make sure that no one ever gets access to the blue key, because anybody who has the blue key can decrypt messages. So once we have assigned these different meanings to the two keys, it's easy to uh, think of the encryption scheme and seeing that um, Alice has the public red key and she uses it for encryption and then only Bob will be able to decrypt it again with the blue key. Yeah. Is that clear to everybody? It's not very different from the symmetric schema, right? But <coughs> now we can use the very same schema to attain something different, which we call electronic signature. So before, we assigned both the keys to Bob. But what happens if we would assign both keys to Alice and we also switch the meaning of the two keys, meaning that the red key is now the private key and the blue one is the public. Now, in that case, you can um, say this is a, an electronic signature scheme. Um, why? This um, works by um, just Alice, who has the only private key. Um, she takes the message and encrypts it with her private key. And then she sends both the encrypted message and the um, plain message via email to Bob. And then Bob can use the blue key to decrypt the message again, or we also say verify the message, and then compare the de um, decrypted message with the plain message and see if they both match. And if they match, he can be sure that no one tampered with the message in between. And he can also be sure that only Alice can have sent the message because only she was able to generate the encrypted version in the first place, right? So in this case, we do not talk about encrypting and decrypting, but we talk about signing and verifying a signature. <coughs> Are there questions so far? Yes, you? Can Bob uh, encrypt and decrypt messages with this scheme? That's a good question. So um, the question is whether Bob could be able to um, end and decrypt the message with, uh, with one of the keys. 
So in this case of the electronic signature, we do not really consider any confidentiality. Later on, we can combine both this asymmetric encryption and the signature to obtain both. But now at the moment, we only look at signatures. And Bob is only able to verify signatures because only he, uh, he has only the blue key and not the red one. So he's not able to fake any signatures. Does that answer your question? Okay. So reviewing the asymmetric encryption scheme, now we have everything we want. We have secrecy by using the uh, asymmetric encryption scheme by encrypting with the public key. And we attain both authenticity and integrity if we encrypt with the private key instead. And yeah, this is very true for authenticity and we also gain integrity by using the trick that we send both the encrypted message and the plain message to the other person. So there were four keys by now involved in the scenario, but you may wonder um, how many keys are there in total. So in the perfect setting, we have two people talking to each other and anyone wants to be able to encrypt and sign a message to each other and anybody has to have key pairs with private and public keys. So we have eight keys in total, but we only talk about four key pairs. <clears throat> and now we can think about what do we do to send a message from Alice to Bob. So the first thing we do on Alice's side is Alice will take her private signing key, the first key, to sign the message. Then she will use Bob's public encryption key, which is the second key, to encrypt the message. Now we gain both um, integrity, authenticity and secrecy. Then she can transmit the message. She has only used two keys by now. And now Bob on the recipient side will first decrypt the message using his private encryption key. And after he has um, decrypted the message, he will use Alice's public signing key to verify the, co um, the signature. So now we have used four keys for one transmission direction and we used um, the other four keys for the different direction. <coughs> so now we're done, right? We have all we, all we wanted. Well, it's not that easy because we now know what we want, this perfect setting with the eight keys. But how do we get there? The first step, of course, is you have to generate all the key pairs you own on your side. So this is quite easy. We hack in the commands later on in the course and then you end up with your keys. But you also have to publish your public keys to all the other recipients. So how do we um, get that the other person has our public keys? The easiest way to do that would be just to send them uh, the public key. So we print it out to, into a letter and send that letter to the other person and he will have some weird content with lots of text and numbers in it and he has to type it in and yeah, he has some sheet of paper and there is no name on it and maybe if he has 10 or 20 of these letters he will screw up the names and doesn't know who it belongs to. So this is not ideal. Um, the second idea would be to solve the problem, send the public key and the name of the key. Well, that's better. You can also think of a file on your system where, the file, where you have both the name and the public key, but it's still not coupled. So you can take the public key and just exchange the name and put some other name in and nobody will notice because you're not able to recognize that. So a public key and a name are not connected together. But what about if we would send the key and the name of the person and consider this as another message we want to send and sign that message. So this is what we call a certificate and I can tell you this is the approach that works. So what we want to do is we want the key and the name coupled to that key and we sign it with our own key and then the other person is able to verify the signature. And if, we, if someone goes and exchange the names, he will break the signature and everybody will immediately notice. So we want to transmit certificates, right? But how do we transmit the certificates? Oh, yeah? Now we can do that approach, like how can the other person So in, um, the question is how does the person um, encrypt the message without having the key? Um, in that case... The sign, I mean, his public key. And how do I get his public key? Uh, good question. Um, I explained it a bit too roughly. So you use your own signing key to sign the certificate. And you obviously have your own private signing key and you are able to um, create the signature and yeah, just send the signed message. 
that the other one doesn't have the, the, the public key because that's what you want to send. So how can you, can you veri verify it, verify the signature? That's a good question, yeah. Um, we will look later on how people are, ver are able to verify whether the key is really the key from the person we think he is. This is a very open problem in cryptography and there are some solutions to that. I will show you later on, so be patient for a moment. <coughs> so um, back to our topic, we want to transfer the certificate. The obvious way to go is to just print it out and type it in on the recipient side. It would look something like this. This is a part of my public key and it's not feasible for any human being. So <clears throat> it would work, but it's impractical. The easier way would be to use a USB key. You copy the, priv uh, the public key to a USB key and hand it over to the other person and then he can uh, copy it on his local drive, import it and he will have the public key. So this works. Um, the next way would be of course sending it via email, but again with the properties of an email. We can't be sure who the sender is and we can't be sure whether the content has been modified. <coughs> we can also use something which we call key servers, which is just a, a public computer of somebody else and anybody can upload keys to the server and anybody is able to download keys from that server without using emails. It's just for convenience. But as Dorian already raised the question, how can we be sure whether the authenticity of the key is granted? So the authenticity of the key means that the key we have on our local drive from the other person, is it the key of the person which has the name on it? We will see later on in the practice part, um, you can write any name you want on the key and you can't be sure about it's, whether it's really the person you want to talk to. So the easiest way is to control the entire transfer path from the source to the destination. <coughs> Which means that for the printout and the USB key, if you hand over the printout to the other person, it's safe. While the email and the key server approach are not. Why are they not? Because an email can be modified, an attacker could exchange the attachment to your mail and exchange it with its own private uh, public key. And on the key server, anybody can upload keys and you don't, if you have uh, 10 different jacks on the key server, you don't know which one to choose. <coughs> so this new aspect is what we call the key, um, the trust in the key ownership. And there are three ways to attain uh, the trust in the key ownership. The first one being we control the entire transfer path. What does that mean? This means that I hand the USB key to the other person and see that he obtains the key and he will plug it into this machine and nobody will interfere in the transmission. So this is obviously only possible if you're able to meet in person. Um, the second way would be to verify the fingerprint after receipt. Um, the fingerprint of a key is something which um, is just a number which is obtained by compressing your key and have some very compact format you can compare more easily than the public key itself. And then you could imagine that you call the other person by phone and recognize the voice of that person and you read out your own fingerprint and the other person can verify that the fingerprint matches with the one he has on the hard drive. And the third option um, is the web of trust. You might have heard of that already and um, this will be covered in the course too, so I won't um, tell anything about now. Just keep it in the back of your mind. <coughs> Now, um, once we are, have verified that we trust the key, we want to be able to communicate that we trust the key now. And we do that by signing the key. And <coughs> signing the key means that you have checked the ownership of the key. And you should always verify this ownership before you sign a key. So again, we just treat the key and the, uh, actually the certificate as a message and instead of the owner signing it with, with his own signing key, you as a um, second party sign it with your signing key and confirm that you have verified the ownership, that it really belongs to the person with the name on it. And this way you will end up collecting um, all the different signatures from other people who have verified your signature and have something I have indicated on the right side here. <clears throat> so now we um, are able to understand all the different um, key types GPG has. The first and the second one are quite easy by now, say, signing and encrypting for messages. And there is also a third type which GPG calls certification. Certification means just signing of other people's keys. So there is a difference between signing messages for signature and certification for signing keys. So. Um, now we move on to the last big topic of the theory part, the web of trust. 
So now as you're a regular GPG user, you have signed some other people's key and these signatures form edges in the graph between people. So having a graph, uh, an edge in the graph from Alice to Bob means that Alice has verified and signed Bob's key. And for Bob, the, the arrow to the person below means that Bob in turn has verified the ownership of the, per of the key of the person on the bottom. And the person on the bottom, in turn, has verified the ownership of the shop's key we see on the right side. So, okay, we have a web of trust and they are somehow connected. What does that give to us? Um, just as before, we want to be sure that um, the key is really from the person which we think she, uh, he is. So, imagine we have Alice on the left side above and Alice wants to place an order at the shop on the bottom. And she, of course, has to um, set, send the order via email and she wants to encrypt and sign the message to make sure nobody tampers with the amounts of items she orders and things like that. But she, doesn't, um, she can obtain the key from the shop owner via a key server, that's not a problem, but she has to verify the key ownership, of course. Um, she can't meet the person um, in person because she sits in Taiwan and he sits in the US and it's not possible to meet and also because of the different time zones um, calling each other is difficult. So we want to use the web of trust. What does that mean? Um, Alice looks at the web of trust and sees that she trusts Bob's key. And Bob in turn trusts the key of the person on the bottom because he verified it. And the person on the bottom has verified the key of the shop owner. And now um, Alice can follow this path of trust to the shop owner and therefore be a little bit more certain about whether the sh um, key of the shop owner is really from the shop owner. <coughs> but um, as you might notice this introduces yet another aspect. So for the web of trust we do not only have to consider the um, signatures on other people's keys but we also have to judge the reliability of the people. Meaning that we have to trust in the key owner being a sensible user. Um, a, an edge in the web of trust therefore consists of all on, on the one side Bob's signature on Alice's key, this is just as before signing the key, but we also have to trust Bob that he doesn't just sign random keys without verifying them. And only if we are sure that Bob is a sensible user we can derive um, that we can trust in Alice's key. Otherwise um, the signature of Bob is just um, not worth any penny and you can not be sure about it. So this is the web of trust. Are there questions about that? Not any questions. Good. So, sorry. Where do you yeah. get? Where do you get all these other keys? Where you get the keys from? Um, from the key server, for example. Everybody uploads his key to the key server, and then anybody can go to the key server and obtain the public key from the other person. Yeah. How how do we know who trusts whom? Um, how do we know who trusts which other key? Um, we see that because um, if you sign the key from, other, from another person, you upload the key again and then the key with your signature on it is on the key server. So if you download the key, you also get all the signatures from the other people and then you are able to follow these signatures. Yeah? But doesn't that key server then introduce like a single point of failure? Because if I remember right, the MIT hosted the key server once had a problem that it didn't insert the date where you upload the key, but just had like a, a date field where you could put a date for the upload and so you could like fake keys for things in the past. Mm -hmm. so the question is whether the key server um, would be a single point of failure and if he would do something wrong uh, they would screw up the entire scheme. So first of all there are quite a lot of key servers around so the MIT server is not the only one you can access. Um, GPG has its own key server and in case they all are down you can still move to um, sending the key via email. Nothing hinders you from doing that. And also the um, metadata you mentioned about when the key was uploaded does, is not really part of the GPD schema. So you do not, don't need that information even if it's wrong to do the encryption and verification um, steps. Is that okay? Okay. So in GPG we have different trust levels to indicate the trust in other users. The first one being not trusted at all. This is the default if you download the key. You don't know anything about the other person, you have to set the trust level manually. 
Then there is the second level, which is called marginally trusted, where you can say that, yeah, he has understood the rough concepts, but he's not quite sure what he's doing. I only trust him marginally. Um, the third one is fully trusted. This is only for other users where you think that they have fully understood GPG and that you really trust um, them in doing signatures thoroughly. And the last one is the trust level you should only use for your own key, which is ultimately trusted. You are own, only you by yourself trust yourself. So as a last um, point, we have some best practices about, yeah, these are not key concepts of GPG, but they are important to remember. Um, the first one being a strong passphrase. You need a, press, a passphrase because um, if you want to encrypt, uh, decrypt a message with your private keys, GPG will keep the private keys only encrypted on your local hard drive and to decrypt it you have to use the passphrase. So in case your key gets stolen, this passphrase is the only barrier between you and your key being compromised. So better choose a strong passphrase for your private keys. Um, the second point is key backup. In case your hard drive fails or your laptop gets stolen, your keys are away, your private keys, and nobody will be able to recover them for you if you haven't made a backup of them. So you better have a different, a different drive, maybe in a different location, um, where you have the private keys as a backup. So the third point is the expiration date. In case you didn't make a backup of your private keys and the key gets lost, this, will, this key will be around forever. It will be on any key server you ask it for, and nobody will recognize that the key has been lost and yeah, you shouldn't use it anymore because it's, uh, nobody is able to decrypt messages for it. Um, the expiration date somehow sets an end to this sad story because um, in some years the key is not valid anymore and then GPG will also hinder you from using um, expired keys. <coughs> so the fourth point is a revocation certificate. What is that? A revocation certificate is just a message where you, as a key owner, can say my key is not valid anymore and then you sign this message with your private key. Then it is a revocation certificate and then you can keep it offline on a different drive in case you someone think that your key has been compromised, so somebody else has stolen it and you're not sure that you're the only owner anymore. Then you can publish the revocation certificate even in case you don't have the private key anymore. You can upload the revocation certificate to the key server and then anybody sees, ah, the owner has revoked the key and I should not be using it any longer. And last but not least, once again, always check the other people's key before you sign them. So, are there questions on the theory part? Yeah? Um, you can set an expiration date, whatever you want, and you can prolong it or um, shorten the um, expiration time at any point in time. Yeah, that's possible. Mm -hmm. But if somebody gets my key, uh, spell it, whatever, and mm -hmm. also gets the passphrase right, they would be able to uh, renew the expiration date, right? Exactly. But in that case, um, uh, I shall repeat the question Sandra indicates. Um, the question was whether um, if the key is um, compromised, somebody else gets access to it, he can sign um, any stuff he wants and then he can also um, extend the expiration date. So in that case you can reuse the revocation certificate. If you once have revoked your own key, it is um, revoked forever. You can't um, take that back anymore. So that's the way to go in that case. There was a question over there? No more question? Okay. <coughs> Great, so I would say we take a short break for now, about 10 minutes, and we meet again at 5 to 6. See you, everybody. For GPG, you only have to remember one single command, which is... Ah, I should just explain the setup here. What we see here are two consoles on two different machines, which I will use to simulate two different people talking to each other. We will first look more to the right side where we will generate a new key and things like that and we will send messages to the other terminal for illustration purposes. So, <coughs> back to the very own command you have to remember. First of all, GPG. Everything we do um, starts with GPG. And then you press minus minus help. Then you get lots of output and <coughs> we start on top of that output. Oh, perfect. 
Um, first of all, we see some version information and licensing stuff. This is not that um, interesting. We also see the encryption algorithms we can use. If you're new to that stu uh, whole stuff, you better do not look too closely. And here are the interesting parts. These are the commands. So during the practice part, I will introduce most of them to you and you will know what they all stand for and how you can use them. But always remember, this is the only command you need to gain access to all the features GPG offers. So the first thing, if you want to use GPG, is you won't need to generate a key. So how do we do that? You first type GPG and then minus minus gen key. Then you hit enter and you see the first thing it asks you for is your real name. So it has no way to verify your real name. This is the point where you can write any name you want on the key. Nobody will verify it. So just to go ahead, um, what's your name? <laughs> your name is Martin, so I will write your name on it. <coughs> so we just say you're Martin Doe, I don't want to know that. <coughs> and then it asks you for the email address. And again, you just have to type something that looks like an email address. So I will just type this. It doesn't have to be valid anyway. So now it asks me whether this is really what I want. So we can look at it. We selected a user ID. A user ID is just a combination of a name and an email address to that key. And then it asks me whether it is correct. And this is obviously correct. And I want to say OK. And now in the background, there is much mathematics going on. They generate numbers and test them for certain properties, but you don't notice that too much. Instead, it will ask you for a passphrase, and this is the um, point where you have to choose the, it wisely. So, you know, the usual passphrase rules apply. It should be at least eight characters. It should contain capital and small letters. It should contain numbers and special characters. And in case you don't have any password, you can come to me. I have a list of very good passwords with me. So <laughs> for demonstration purposes now, I will choose a very simple passphrase. <coughs> and now I have to type that passphrase again instead in case of a typo. Yeah. Um, why is it called a passphrase? Uh, because it uh, accepts space characters and you can um, build a sentence? Um, yes, and exactly that is the difference between the, um, the question is um, why is it called a passphrase? Can you build entire sentences with that? Yes, this is possible. So this is why it's called passphrase and not password. It should invite you to choose the longest phrase you could ever think of and still remember it. So <coughs> yeah, choose a strong passphrase. You in the back? Uh, but shouldn't you use really words because you can run dictionary attacks on it? Yes. Um, Dictionary, <laughs> dictionary attacks are a problem, so um, you should not just choose plain words on that. You should choose with capital and small letters mixed, not um, sensible as it is in the dictionary, but you should choose numbers and special characters in, in between them. So um, in the meantime, GPG has finished generating the new key. Um, now, what does it display to us? First, there is some processing information in here. It's not that interesting if it, everything goes well. And um, what is interesting is this part here where it displays the key to us. Um, the first thing it uh, tells us is it's a public key in here and it tells us which algorithm it used. So this is a sensible default GPG chooses for us. It's called the RSA alg algorithm and it chooses a key size of 2048 bits. A bit size is just a measure we use in cryptography to indicate the strength of the key and 2048 for now is a sensible default value. Next to the um, algorithm, we see the key generation date, which is obviously today. And then we have these uh, strange letters here. They indicate the meaning GPG assigns to that key. So the S stands for signing. So we can sign other people's um, keys, uh, messages with that key. And the C stands for certification. Just remember the meanings of the different key GPG has. So we have one key for both signing messages and keys. And we also see the expiration date here. So GPG did not ask us for any expiration date. It just shows two years as a sensible default value. Then after the key, we see the fingerprint of that key. So it's just a very long hexadecimal number and you can read it out to the other person via telephone. We will look at verifying fingerprints later in the, in the practice part. And after the fingerprint, we see the user ID we just set. So Martin Doe with the email address we have. 
and then we see a sub key because by now we only have um, a signing and certification key. So I just said sub key, right? Um, there is a difference in GPG between one key which is used for certification. This is called the master key. It can be used at least for certification and in this case also to sign messages. And this master key can you be used to sign your other keys, which in this case is the encryption key. We see the encryption key here, which has the E, which stands for encryption, and the certification key um, signs the other sub key to guarantee that you generated that encryption key and that people should use that key. So now we have generated our first key pair, right? But um, you might be some kind of a crypto nerd and the defaults are not suitable for you and you want to have full control. So you want your own private key generation, you have customized to your own needs and you do that by generate a different key with a different command which is um, full gen key. If I hit enter now we see a little bit differently the prompt. Um, the first prompt is for the algorithm I want to use. Again, if you're not very into cryptographic algorithms, you should stick to the defaults and yeah, <coughs> that's it. So now we see the different algorithms here. I want just to go for RSA, so I choose one here. I hit enter. Now it asks me for the key size and again it displays me the default it would choose for me, but I know I'm better than GPG. I want to use something different, which is a key of 4092 bits and then I can go on and now it asks me for the expiration date. So I can type in anything I want here. For example, I want it to be valid to for 30 years, so I don't have to mess with the expiration date. You should not do that with the real key, it's just for demonstration. So just not every, anybody could copy that. I would just take 30 days and then it will say that it has computed um, the 6th of May for the expiration date and it asks me if it's correct and yes, it is correct. Then we go to the usual key generation procedure. I can do anything I want here again. And I can also add a comment. I don't know what it's used for, but you can set a comment if you want to, like my favorite key, for example. And then you hit enter. So we generated a user ID and now it asks me if that is okay. I say yes. And again, it asks me for a cool passphrase. I will choose a very strong here as well. <coughs> And now it will generate the key in the background and this will take a while again. It might take a bit longer on your own machine because um, it depends on the CPU power your PC has. So when I did it at home it was finished by now. <laughs> okay, fine. So now we have generated our key. Again the same output as the other one and the only difference is the fingerprint, of course. We have an entirely different fingerprint by now. And all the other settings we did are different as well. So now we want to display our keys. We do this by just typing GPG and say minus K, which is the shorthand for list keys. And this will list all the public keys we have in our key ring. So here you can list the keys from other persons you have. Um, in that case, we have two keys, the one from Martin before and the dummy one I created here. You can also select for a key. You can say, I only want to see Martin's key and check its validity. And then it will only output this one key we have. And in case you only want to display your own key, your say your own private key, you can use the capital K, which stands for list private or I think secret keys. And then you can again say Martin, and in that case, you will see the private key. The difference here is that now it says a seek for a secret key. You have a question there in the back. I will just tell you in a moment how you can remove a key because I have this dummy key and I want to get rid of it, okay? Fine. Um, so you want to remove the key again. So I type GPG minus minus delete keys first for the public key and because it's a secret key as well I say secret keys and the name I chose was a bit awkward just copy paste it here and then it says I want to remove this key so I hit enter and now there are quite a few security checks you have to go through so it asks you if you want to really remove the key I say yes I want to so this contains a secret key do you really want to remove that secret key yes I want so 
look at the key again, please. Um, this is the private key. Um, do you want to remove this very key? Yes, delete this key. Well, there is also a sub key related to that key. Do you want to also remove that key? Yes, I want to remove. And now you're done removing a secret key. So it's very safe and it should not be possible to remove the key if you're drunk or something like that. <coughs> yeah, so now we remove the secret key. But you might display your secret keys now and you see the key is gone. But what you still have in your key ring is the public key. This is different from the secret key and we still have this nasty name here. In that case we just go for delete keys and then we say the same name again. And now the checks are a bit easier, remove the key, yes, and you're done. Because public keys are not that um, worthy because you can obtain them from any key server or from the original person again and it's no hassle usually. So now we have removed the key as well and we can display the keys and now we end up only with our own key. Sandra. What if you lose your uh, public key that you have not shared with anybody? Could you regenerate it from the secret key? Uh, no, that's not possible. Ah, sorry. So, <laughs> um, is it possible to, um, if you have removed the public key, to um, obtain it again from your secret key? Um, in general, in the mathematics, it's not possible. So if you have lost one of the keys, it's not possible to obtain the other one. But um, for GPG, it has some convenience features and with every secret key, it also stores the public key. So it's not possible to just remove uh, the secret key without the public key, but removing this... I think I screwed it up somehow. But um, yeah, if you have the secret key, you can always um, obtain the public key as well in GPG if you have the file somewhere. So I hope this answers the question. Um, now we have generated our key pair and as I told you before you should make a backup of your key. So how do I do that? I first type GPG again and now I use the export option to export a key. And I want not only to export the key, I also want it to be A, which stands for ASCII Armored. So if you export a key it has some binary data in it and if you just uh, say say this without the key and say Martin, it will output this, which is binary data. And your command line is not able to output that uh, binary data very well. So you better want to have some letters and numbers you can easily copy paste into your email editor. This is what the A does for you. If you say A, you have this nice output and you also have this um, brackets around it, which says this is a GPG public key. And then you can copy paste this text to your editor and send it to your friends. Or, as I do now, you can just save it in a file um, for later on. Now you see you have the Martin public key here. Now you can send this um, file to all your friends, you can upload it to your key server and share it to the public. But to do the backup of your private key, you do something very similar to that. You just say again gpg minus minus export. Now it's called secret keys. And again you say Martin. Sorry, I so want to say Marty all the time. <laughs> um, and we also want to have it ASCII armored again, and we output it into martin.secretkey. And now if we want to export the secret key, it asks us for the passphrase, because it first has to decrypt the file it has in its um, internal key store to be able to export it. So if you have forgotten your key phrase by now, you should go again to the generation phase. I know my passphrase, so I'm able to export the key. If I display it now again, I see that there is the secret key as well. Um, yeah, the secret key should not be shared to your friends. Yeah, they have to guess the passphrase, but anyway, it's safer to keep it just on your local machine, on some offline USB key, however, keep it safe. <coughs> so as a last step for the key generation phase, we want to generate a revocation certificate. This is just as easy as gener generate revoke. And again, I have to say for what uh, user I want to generate the revocation certificate. And then it asks me for this key and I say yes. And then I can uh, set a reason for the revocation certificate. Of course, you are not able to uh, foresee the future, so it's not really sure what you want to set here. You can just generate a revocation certificate for each of the reasons here. But um, I may go for just generating the one for the key has been compromised. So I press one and I can also type in an optional description. I don't want a description. This is okay for me. 
And now I again have to um, type in my passphrase. This is because um, GPT generates a message for me and I have to sign that message. And to sign a message, I need the passphrase. <clears throat> so now I'm done. And because I did not redirect the output, I have here my um, revocation certificate. So you can just uh, copy that into a file and keep it offline just as secret as your private key. In case an attacker is able to gain access to your revocation certificate, he can destroy your private key because he can publish the revocation certificate without any further check. So better keep the revocation certificate as safe as the secret key. Good, so now we're done with all the key generation steps and we end up with some files on our file system. For preparation now, I have already imp um, Oops. I have already um, added a file from the other user over here, which is the public key from that user. I have it in this file here, and now I can import the key from the other person. In case you use a key server, it is even more convenient, but imagine that uh, your friend has sent you this file via email attachment and you have to import it. So you do this by just typing gpg import yan.ascii. Then I hit enter and then it tells me, yes, it has processed one key and it has imported one key and yeah, the key is here. So now show me the key as before. I have to type lower lace K and now I see the key. Um, this key is a bit more evolved um, than the demonstration key because I have more than one email address. But yeah, this is the way you import a public key from another person. So now we want to make use of that key and encrypt our first message. So first of all, we need a message. I have prepared that already. We see it in here. We have a secret message and I just um, adapted a little bit so you don't see I did not fake. So we want to send that message to Martin once again. I just save the message and now we want to encrypt it. This is done by typing gpg minus e, which stands for encryption, obviously. We want to sign that message as well and we want to have it ASCII armored as everything else. And then I have to type the file I want to encrypt. This is a secret message. And then I hit enter. Now GPG wants to know to which recipient I want to encrypt the message to. In that case, it's easy. I want to encrypt for Jan. So there is no user ID for Jan. Maybe I do not have to type the name, but take the fingerprint instead. I just type the fingerprint and now it should be able to resolve. Yes. So what it does here, here is what I entered and then there is much text going on. There is no assurance this key belongs to the named user, which means that, yeah, I have a key which is called Jan and um, I'm not able to derive that the key is trusted. So GPG tells me that it is not able to verify the key ownership trust. We will see later on how we can solve this problem, but for now we just go ahead. So um, it wants to encrypt for Jan, that's fine. The fingerprint is fine as well. Again, it warns me that it is not certain that the key really belongs to Jan, but it's fine for now. Use this key anyway, yes. So now we have Jan as recipient and it will maybe I want to send it to another person. In that case, I can um, list another user here. I just type an empty line and now we're done. So where is the encrypted file? It's just next to the original file here. And I can just show you the output of that file. It's just as garbled as the other text before. And obviously it must be encrypted because it only contains nonsense, right? <coughs> so now we have the message. We can copy paste it to our email editor if we want to. I will use something different for now because I don't want to use emails. Um, I just get the file from the other user and I copy it to the other user who is the recipient. So if I hit enter now, I have transmitted the message. You can think of the email being sent now. So now I have the secret, whoa, the secret message any, somewhere, somewhere here. And now I want to decrypt the message. How do I do that? I do that by typing gpg minus d for decryption. And I also want to verify the signature from the key. Then I type the secret message.ask file and I hit enter. So now it tries to decrypt the message and Obviously, I'm able to decrypt the message, right? There is much output, but it's not hard to discover. Here is the message we um, encrypted in the first place. So why were we able to decrypt the message? Because we were the owner of the private encryption key, and obviously we can encrypt the message, decrypt the message. 
But what we were not able to, and GPG also complains about it, we were not able to um, check the signature of the key, because for that we need Marty's public key. And we do not have it, and GPG tried to obtain it via the key server, but it is not on any key server, so it fails. This is what this message is about. So how do we um, get the public key? I just get it from the other person as well. I send another email in that case. I just get um, martin.pub. If I would type secret here, I would have stolen his private key. This is not what we want. We just copy the public key. Now I have it on my local machine and I can just do import as I did before, martin.pub. So now we imported the key and we can now try to decrypt the message again. We are again able to decrypt the message and this time we will get a slightly different output. Um, you have to search a little bit for it. So this is the important part, good signature from Martin. So now we are sure that nobody tampered with the message in between and we are sure that um, the message comes really from Martin. But there is some additional warning which tells me that um, yes, the message was signed with this key, but it was not able to verify the key. So GPG tells me that I should better go and verify the key ownership once again. But now we're done, right? We have encrypted a message on the sender side and we have decrypted it on the recipient side. So this is all you have to do in your daily business when sending mails. So as a next step, we might want to publish our key to other people so we don't have to copy it from network connection to network connection directly. So I would just say send keys. And again, I type Martin. And if I now hit enter, it would open up a connection to a key server, the default one, which is set by GPG, and it would publish the key to that key server. This is a step you cannot revoke anymore. So once it's published, you can't uh, retrieve it from the key server and delete it. This is a one step solution, uh, one, one shot. And this, um, and because of that, I won't do that now because it's only a demonstration key and I do not want to pollute the key server. But this is the way to go. So once we have um, uploaded the key to the key server, on the recipient side we can say we want to receive the key from the key server. And then I could say Martin, but this is a huge key server with many keys on it and there might be more than one Martin, so this is not the way to go. <laughs> and in that case it's better to choose uh, the fingerprint. You can just transmit the fingerprint via insecure email, it's fine for the key transmission or you can just send it via email in the first place, which is much easier. So you can just um, look for the fingerprint of Marty somewhere above here and copy this over to the other person and then he would be able to receive the key. There are some key servers which also offer some HTML website where you can browse interactively with the keys, which makes it easier to pick a key where you do not have the key signature, uh, the fingerprint for. So this is how you deal with key servers. It's easy, you send the keys and you receive keys. That's all. So now comes the important part, right? Um, Jan and Martin have decided to meet in person someday. And of course, they also want to sign each other's key. So what they, do they do for that event? First of all, they have to prepare a little bit. It's not much. Let's look at what Martin has to do. Martin just um, says he wants to edit his own key to see the fingerprint of his key. And to do that, he types Marty, and now I end up with some interactive GPG console, and I can just type FPR for the fingerprint, and then it prints out the fingerprint. You can just write that on a piece of paper and take that piece of paper to the meeting. That's all you have to do for preparation, just write that down. So during the meeting, you can exchange the piece of paper, and you will end up with the key pair of, uh, with the fingerprint of the other person, and you will take the key from the other person home. And on the other side, which is here, I can just say, mm, I will do it here as well. So um, you can imagine that Martin now is in, in possession of Jan's um, fingerprint and he can type again. First, I have to leave this console and I type edit key again, but this time I want to edit Jan's key. So this is my key. It's a bit longer than the demonstration key here, but um, the principles are the same. So the first thing I do is I have to verify the fingerprint, right? I type fingerprint as well. And now I take out the piece of paper from the meeting and compare it to the output on the screen. And since we don't have um, the piece of paper now, I can just do the same step on the other machine. So I say Jan, 
this is my key and I can compare it and hopefully nobody interfered my communication here and we will end up comparing equal. So now J um, Martin is able to sign the key because he has verified that the fingerprint is correct. How does he do that? He just says I want to sign. Then he hits enter. Now GPG asks me if I want to sign all the user IDs. So what does that mean? Um, if I sign a key, I do not only sign the key itself, but I also sign the names that are coupled to the key. So I cert certify with my key that all these user IDs really belong to the user Jan. And because you have met in person, you can be sure that this is the case. You can, for example, ask for the passport for, of the other person and verify the name on it. So I'm sure about, I want to sign the um, user IDs. Um, now it asks me with which you, um, key I want to sign. So I only have the key of Martin, so it already suggests that to me. Do you really want to sign it with Martin's key? And now it says yes. And it might, yeah? Um, there are four email addresses up there. How do yeah. you verify that all of those are belonging really to you? That's a good point. Um, how do I verify whether all these emails really belong to the person? Because um, I could just claim to own that email address without being the real owner and I could launch an attack in between. Um, of course, if you only verify the name, it's not possible. So if you want to do a very thorough verification, you have to go during the meeting and send some message to the other person by using your mobile phone and use that email address. And then the other person has to present that mail account to you and um, has to um, prove to you that he is the real owner of that email address. So this is what you would do if you would sign email addresses. But usually um, what I like more as an idea about GPG is that you sign that the name of the key really belongs to the um, person. So you do not um, sign the, the email address ownership, but you sign key ownership. This is what the original idea was about. But you're right, um, if you want to also certify email addresses, you also would have to verify that. So now the key is signed. And usually it goes without any more um, confirmation, but it might be that you just rebooted the machine and in that case GPG does not remember your passphrase and you might um, type in that passphrase once again because you're using your private key. Now it's not pass, uh, necessary because um, GPG already cached it for us. So now we can say save and now GPG has signed um, my key. I can also display the signatures now. For that I have to say I want to check six of Jan's key and if I hit that now it's hard to read so better do something different here. Um, we see that um, this is my key right and we also see that for each of the user IDs there is one signature from Martin. So Martin has signed um, Jan's uh, this user ID, he has signed this user ID and he also signed this user ID. <coughs> this part is not that important. Yeah. So this is the way you can display signatures of other people, but usually GPG can just handle that under the hood. What is also interesting about it, that there was some error message above, because I have some more signatures on my key than only Martin's signature. These are displayed here, so I have 18 signatures for which Martin does not have the public keys, so he's not very able to verify the signatures from the other people, so it also does not display them. <coughs> So this is how you sign keys. Other questions on that? No. Yeah? Um, we already heard about those different um, levels of trust and we have not seen any of those. Exactly. There is one point missing. How do I say the different trust levels of the users? Um, this is the last point of the practice part. So let's say that uh, Martin and Jan know each other very well and Martin is now able to trust Jan that he signs keys thoroughly. So he also wants to mark that trust. For that he again types edit key and he wants to edit the key of Jan. And now we have a little problem because I did some demonstration and this is um, where the key tr the user trust is indicated. So the, there is already some cache involved which uh, has stored me with my key as fully trusted. So this indicates the fully trusted user level. So we can just go to the other key and to the other user and look at what Marty's key has a trust level here. And here we see, oh, this is a different user. 
if you have name conflicts, things like that happen because this is now Martina and not Martin. So I have first have to display all the Martins I have, which are quite a few. This is the Martin I want to take and then I can use the fingerprint of that user to uniquely identify him. So I now say edit key of Martin with the user ID and now I have um, what I wanted to show to you. This is a new key and by default this is marked as unknown which is not trusted. So now I trust Martin quite a bit and I want to say I trust him so I type trust. Now GPG asks me to what extent do I want to trust Martin. Um, I don't know is yeah this I think this is the default because I don't know is what you do with people you don't know um, there are people where you know that they are not trustworthy you can say they are not trusted you can say that they are marginally trusted you can say fully trusted and ultimately and now I want to say Martin is fully trusted for me and I say four <coughs> and now it says me, it tells me something that please note that the um, shown key validity is not necessarily correct unless you restart the program. So there is some agent running in the background. We first have to restart and then it will be displayed correctly. But yeah, if we say save now, it will be persisted. And yeah, I think it doesn't work by now, but if I say, uh, I have to type the user ID. No. If I say Martin here, it should still show me unknown yeah but yeah this is the way you mark trust levels so this is, was the last open point for the practice part is there something else you would like to see me demonstrating mm -hmm. I think from the um, design of the program we have the idea to um, make some annotations uh, not just the level from the front of the life but like <coughs> um, seeing in person so, so on the IT card or whatever is it possible to make some notes uh, yeah, the question is whether it's possible to add some comments to the trust levels for users to uh, somehow um, as oh, as pointer for oneself how they met and how you verified each other. Um, to my knowledge, this is not possible. So you really only have this um, five different states you can set the keys on. Yeah, you have to remember that uh, on your own. Are there any other questions? No questions. Everything clear. Cool. Then we will end up with 50 new GPG users to by tomorrow, I guess. Um, there might be one last thing I may show to you because um, by now I showed you GPG and this is a common line too, which might not be convenient for your daily business. So I might show you how this is, um, how this works in your email client in the end. So I might just write a new message to a new person, which is me by myself again. Um, I will send a message to myself with some content inside, very secret content, and I can set any subject, so this is a test. And then you see on top there are two tiny buttons I can press and they say sign, I want to sign the message. Um, mm -hmm. I have to set a key, ah, I know, I have to choose the um, user ID which is also on the key, so I have to say student. Um, because I did not register my uh, ETH without student address um, for my key. So I say sign now and it says again the problem. This is if you don't practice um, before, I just choose a different email address. So I want to sign it now. Oh, come on. <laughs> so this is what it's all about. Yeah, I have, I have somehow I have to find it out now. Um, sorry? <laughs> Send an email to Aline. Um, Aline is um, uh, blah, blah. maybe I also pick my ETH mail address. Uh -huh, now it um, automatically recognizes it. I want to sign a message and I will also want to encrypt the message. And now I can send the message and now it asks me for confirmation for the key to choose. And I say okay and now I have to type my own passphrase which is this one and I say okay. And then it does some computation and the message is transmitted. This is all I have to do on sender side. And then I would, yeah. Um, this is possible in GPG. I can go to my send folder because GPG will encrypt the message both for myself and for the other person. So I'm able to do what I'm doing now. Hmm? Actually, this is on email client. My email uh -huh. client, for example, I cannot do this because 
my aim of time only encrypts for the decision. So it depends on aim of time. But most clients do it as an answer. So we will be able to read the most aim. Okay, so this is one point for the Kali suit. Um, yeah, the question was in the first place whether you are able as a sender um, to decrypt the message again. Uh, well, this depends on the client you use. Some clients encrypt the message for your own key and others don't. So Aline might be able to um, receive the message eventually and then she will end up with something like this, which tells me that both the message is encrypted and it has been signed by Jan. And I can also look at the details and now you're also able to understand these details. Like this is um, 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 a short section of the fingerprint, which can also be used to identify the key. And because I have signed my own key, it also says that the signature is valid and the key is trustworthy because I have signed my key. Good. Yeah, there's one more question. What email clients exist that uh, can use the PHP keys? I mean, sure, you can't use like uh, Gmail or Hotmail or whatever because then you would have to store a key on their server and mm -hmm. so they would can. be able to encrypt it again if you don't want that. Yeah, the question is what, what email client can you use to use these convenience features? So um, there are many um, programs you can install in your own machine, like this one, this is Carmail from the KDE suit. And you also have Evolution for GNOME, and there is also some plugin for um, Outlook, I think. But uh, I haven't tested it, I cannot say anything about the quality. There is a plugin on Thunderbird, which I have tested, and it's almost usable, I would say. And yeah, there are some other mail clients around, I might not know, uh, which are also able to send encrypted messages. And then there is another point which you mentioned because there are many online clients which you do not access by um, opening a program on your machine but browsing a website instead. And if you use for example the Gmail um, online interface and Gmail wants to encrypt the message for you, this would mean that you would um, have to give your private key to the Gmail web interface so it's able to encrypt the message for you. So um, there are some approaches where you can uh, generate keys in online interfaces, but if you're really concerned about your, the secrecy of your messages, this is up, uh, uh, an absolutely no-go because you don't want to publish your key on a web interface, right? I hope this answers your question. Um, yeah, another question. Um, what about mobile phones? Uh, I mostly read my emails on the smartphone. So. Yeah. Um, for smartphones, there are some solutions as well. Um, the default um, mail client for Android, for example, which is Gmail as well, is not able to handle encrypted messages. But um, there is one application I use, which is K9 Mail. And if you have K9 mail, you can install another app which um, can manage the keys for you. It's something like a GPG app. And this way you're able to encrypt and decrypt messages on your mobile phone. But again, you have to somehow generate messages either on the phone itself or copy it from your laptop to your mobile phone. But in principle, it's possible to use it, yes. Are there other questions? Yeah. Uh, this email client is Carmail, so K-M-A-I-L. It's part of the KDE um, framework. Other questions? Yeah, Lucas. <laughs> How do I add more email addresses to the key? So we can just, I can demonstrate that to you. We have Marty's key over here and we want to add another mail alias for that key. So we first edit that key again and I did not mention that before but inside this shell you again have a huge help screen with a lot of helpful commands and if you scroll around a bit you see somewhere that you can add user ID which is this one and if you type that it will ask you for another real name just dur as during the key generation and I can say I want to be Marty now, be a bit more um, up to date. And I have another email address and a comment. And now what happens is GPG asks me for my passphrase again because if I add another um, user I ID, this is something only the owner of the private key can do. So I have to use my private key and therefore decrypt it and therefore I have to type my passphrase. And now you're done. And 
You might also note that now I have one ultimately trusted Martin and one unknown Martin and I can easily uh, fix that again by setting I also ultimately trust the other Martin. Um, yes, so this is how you add more um, user IDs. Let's go on, more questions. No more questions? Yeah. And what I know is the behavior of the main kind of data main encrypted. So if it's on a remote server, that makes sense. But then ultimately I would like to make some my own hard disk and maybe there is an encrypted partitions that are going to retreat some of those parts usually. So what would you suggest? Um copy pasting. <laughs> I did not look into that use case, so I can't give a more evolved answer on that. Um, copy pasting obviously works, it's not convenient, but I think if you, for example, export emails with Kmail, um, they will be stored unencrypted. So this would be a way to go. Other questions? Great, then that's all from my side. I thank you all for coming and showing interest in encryption. And yeah, have a good evening. <laughs>